I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of The Most Painful Podcast. People who live with chronic pain suffer greatly, and it impacts their quality of life. There are many treatments available and medications that will help people with chronic pain. One of them that's been talked about over the many couple of years, I would say, is cannabis. But does cannabis actually work? Is it effective? Canadian veterans suffer from chronic pain twice that of the Canadian population. And the increase in cannabis among the veterans community has doubled or tripled in the last number of years. To help answer these questions, I'm joined by two guests. Dr. Jason Bussa, who's the Director of Research for the Chronic Pain Centre of Excellence and has done a rapid recommendation. And then we also have Bruno Gavamont, who is a Afghan vet, a life coach, a speaker, and is also consults to a number of organizations on cannabis and psychedelic use. Welcome, the two of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So cannabis, does it work? How much should a person use? Jason, you've done some research. Maybe you can just give us the highlights of that research. Yeah, we, we undertook a, what you called a rapid recommendation recently. Uh, there were two competing guidelines that had come out. Um, one from the UK NICE organization that made a strong recommendation against use of cannabis for chronic pain and a position statement from the International Association for the Study of Pain that also came out against the use of cannabis. We took a look at the evidence and what we found is there was reasonable evidence that cannabis uh, used therapeutically may benefit a minority of individuals with chronic pain. What do I mean by minority? It looks like compared to placebo, about one in 10 individuals that try medicinal cannabis will experience an important benefit in pain relief. So it appears as if it might not work for many who try it, but there may be an appreciable minority for whom it will be effective. There are a lot of areas that we don't fully understand in terms of uh, the sort of you know, optimal formulation, mechanism of use, uh, but we do see some initial promising signal for, again, a minority of individuals who live with chronic pain. And so when I hear that, it sounds small group of people are, are getting some positive effect out of it. So, Bruno, when you're working with veterans or you're advising organizations on cannabis use, what are you seeing? Is, first of all, is, do veterans know the proper way to use cannabis dosing, for example? That is, that is I, I love that you started with this, uh, this question, actually. Um, the answer I'm going to tell you within the networks of veterans is no. Nobody knows how much to use. Nobody knows. It's a start low and go slow kind of a deal when you're giving your uh, dosage. Um, there is different kind of dosage that are going out there. And I think it's pretty much people into the community of veterans asking what what should we take and what shouldn't we take and how much should we take and kind of this conversation that's going going out and which puts us in a little bit of a not a little bit but a lot in a trial and error kind of approach to it which is what I do now is you know I go around and I educate the veterans and the organization on how to properly you know use the uh, the cannabis for chronic pain or post traumatic stress disorder and the thing is, is at the beginning, I was totally against it. I was against the stigma of serving in the military for 15 plus years before that. And uh, what prompted me to go on it and, and, and the things that I was seeing of cannabis uh, use within the veterans community wasn't the best. Uh, there was a lot of overuse. There was a lot of people just giving the cannabis, then go home and try to, you know, which way you can take it because there's different ways to take it, which actually affects the effects of how long it's going to last, how much you're going to get, the bioavailability and all this stuff. I had to search, research that myself at the time. That was in port, uh, 2018 because I had to come off of all of my anti-inflammatory and sleeping pills because I had been on it for too long. And it was causing some side effects with my organs, my stomach, my kind of, of, of long use of medicine that is, uh, you know, prescribed before. And now I've been off all of those medicines since 2018. And I use a very small amount on a daily basis, mostly CBD and a little bit of THC because they work hand in hand, depending on, on, on what we're going to talk about today. But the missing part is still the education within the community 
and uh, and where to start and what to start with and what is it that we're looking for. When you did your research, Jason, was there a lot of information out there already on the use of cannabis, clinical trials, you know, how it impacts chronic pain? Because it sounds to me like Bruno was saying it was a challenge to find some of this information. I, I, I would agree entirely with, with Bruno. So we did find um, around 30 randomized control trials. Uh, they were small studies. The studies that we found looked at all non-inhaled forms of therapeutic cannabis. And yet we know a lot of individuals that use cannabis therapeutically do use inhaled routes, either through smoking or vaping. So we have a limitation in terms of the trial information. The, the, the trials often will look at focusing on either balanced ratios of CBD to THC or higher CBD preparations. And we found from research that we've done looking at patient values and preferences that individuals that use therapeutically align with what Bruno said. They, they are looking for usually more balanced ratios or products higher than CBD. We've done work with clinicians asking them what they think about medicinal cannabis and they are uh, often very concerned about their own lack of knowledge. They don't get formal training during medical school, for example. So it's only if they choose to go out and become knowledgeable in this modality that they'll have information they can give patients. And we've done studies with patients that often say they've had to undergo these, you know, often very prolonged journeys of self-discovery because of a lack of real information and education. So I don't think that Bruno's experience is unique. I think that it's probably more the norm than not. Uh, And there is a real need out there to sort of fill this information gap, because if you don't fill it with information from credible sources, people are going to go to the internet, they're going to go to their local bud tender, and they're going to have to sort of sort through all this information on their own, which can be quite overwhelming and in some cases contradictory. I agree with that. On, on, a, on a veteran thing is that they obviously don't know what your medical condition is if you're there for chronic pain or if you're there for post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, and then we've all learned from growing up that being a kid, you should try this, you should try the other things and everything. But everybody's got a different answer sheet on what they're dealing with. And there should be some support around it to be able to educate what it is that you want to do. And once again, bringing in the coaching or the psychotherapy that goes along with it. Because as veterans, we're often giving either a medication or cannabis and now psychedelics and then go home or, you know, go figure it out. And we go back to whatever problem or whatever situation there was. And because we're talking about chronic pain here, I'm going to tell you that when I did come off all this medication and I was on CBD and a little THC, it made a world of difference for me, a big world of difference. So the, the, the cannabis itself is very effective for alleviating the symptoms of either chronic pain, because I have both chronic pain and post-traumatic stress, is that they're both effective. But once again, at the beginning, I was taking way too much. I was not taking it at the right time. I didn't know the effects of it. I didn't know how to kind of basically balance it out, like Jason was saying. And I think that personally, myself, as who I am as a veteran and the research that I do on the internet and looking at Uh, researchers like Jason does and all these things is that it should have somewhere in the community of these doctors that are prescribing these medicines, a PDF or a, a template of saying, hey, this is where you should start for chronic pain. And these are what you should use. And the difference in when you increase your dosage, like they do for any SSRIs to tell you the truth, like they do with anything else that's dealing with mental health. They tell you, let's start at a low dose and then we'll increase and we'll increase and then we'll get to where that balanced dose is. So why aren't we doing it with cannabis is my question, right? So I think that I'm looking forward to, you know, more research from Jason and and the team to kind of look into this. And when we talk about mental health, PTSD, and we talk about pain, I mean, my understanding of the research is that, you know, someone who has chronic pain usually has some form of mental health with it too, right? So PTSD. And I wonder how many veterans understand that. And of course, centralization too of the nervous system and, and how, say, TMJ could be because are you not sleeping well because of PTSD? Is that why you're grinding your teeth at night? I don't know. Jason, maybe you could kind of highlight some of those those points. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great point. We, we do know that there's not infrequently comorbid, you know, mental health issues. Obviously, being in chronic pain all the time could lead you to becoming frustrated and depressed with that situation. That, that would be an obvious reaction. 
and it might go the other way, right? I mean, if you have PTSD, then you, you might develop habits or patterns that lead you more likely to develop different types of chronic pain. I will say one of the important limitations, another limitation of the trials that we found for the evidence that we looked at is they tend to exclude patients that have comorbid mental illness along with their chronic pain. And so it leaves us less certain as to uh, if there could be either additional benefits to cannabis on comorbid mental illness or if there could be some potential challenges when you have those sort of multiple conditions coming in. So it's another area where we need to, to have some more research, but you're quite right. It's, it's quite common to have the dual presentation, and it's, it would be very interesting to try to understand how cannabis either might be potentially more effective in those more complex presentations, or maybe it's going to have some limitations because of that additional complexity. So it almost sounds a little bit like the Wild West out there when it comes to cannabis. So are it is. You know, so if so Bruno, you know, in your experience, if you have veterans that are trying to self-medicate or perhaps, and and I veterans affairs of course is paying for this if they have approval if I'm correct, right? They're paying for this if there's approval from their family doctor to take it. And then you have the vendor that's selling it and then you have the veteran who's trying to understand it. It sounds to me like it raises a lot of confusion and complexity in the veteran community. Yeah, it does. And then once again, right, the, the thing is what I love is what I'm finding as I'm doing more research and talking to more different types of people and now into the psychedelic, which is even more the, the, <laughs> the, the Wild West because it's just coming up. The thing is, is that you're right. It's about the information that we get and at a time that we need it as well, right? It's very important to do that. So if you're taking, a, we're talking about veterans here. If we take a vet that's been in chronic pains, um, for you know more than a couple of years, right? He's been dealing with that, and then he's got his post-traumatic stress disorder, and and none of these things that he's doing, he or she is doing, is working, right? They're just taking, they're just following what the medical system is saying. Take this medication, take this medication, which do last. I can tell you that I got some cortisone shots in the spine that did last, and it helped me to relieve pain for over almost two years until it didn't work anymore. But when I did find the information that I needed to jump into the cannabis, which was what brought me in was, once again, remember I was uh, against it, was what the CBD research that had been done about the reducing of inflammation, the nerve coding, the helping you with your central um, nervous system, and then understanding what THC does as a pain blocker and unlocking the terpenes and everything that works into it. I was more apt to, I was more into it and I actually started looking at it. But once again, when we got to, if I don't do, I, I'm that kind of person that did that research, but I'm going to tell you everybody that I'm talking to, most people in the veterans community, just, just give me something, just give me the cannabis or just give me the, the next thing or the next thing until this pain goes away. And I'm going to tell you that yes, cannabis is going to take the pain away, but once again, it's not going to fix any of your problems or any of the issues. Uh, when Jason was talking about the comorbidity of chronic pain with the mental illness, uh, it's actually 100% is that if you have chronic pain, you have a mental illness because you become depressed and you start, you know, seeing things, you know, from a pain point of view. And if you have a mental illness, and then you start getting chronic pain, that brings it in. So we know that the science is there to prove that when you alleviate one of the two, it actually helps the other. I can speak for that for, from experience and personal personal uh, journey on that. And to have that moment in time when you're taking the cannabis and you have that relaxed state and you can actually talk to someone and you can look at different opportunities and accept that instead of just that little dark tunnel that you're going through with your chronic pain and your PTSD, I found that cannabis did provide that in the right amount, in the right doses at the right time. But it was it was a lot of work and research and trial and error that had to find that because taking too much cannabis actually sends you the other way as well. You don't really want to do anything. You don't really want to engage. You want to right. So that there's that fine line which comes with education and knowing exactly what the dosage of a person needs and what are they dealing with. And I once again I'm going to say there should be psychotherapy around with it or coaching or some support. So it sounds like anything. It is. It's one medication, but there's other aspects that need to help 
you it's use one it tool out of the toolbox. Yeah, yes. a tool. And I mean, when we're also talking, we're looking at veterans who come from a directive culture to begin with, and they, especially if they've been in for a long time, some of them may not have, as, as you have, the will to move forward. They're looking for someone to provide that direction for them, which makes it more difficult to... Because they're in so much pain, Tom, right? Yeah. They've been struggling, they've been suffering, and all they need is, is somebody to kind of say, take this. And obviously, we trust other veterans, the community, and we say, hey, man, what are you what are you on or what's going on? What's happening? Right. A lot of people had suggested the cannabis before I tried it years before I did try it. And it wasn't appealing to me because they weren't giving me the information that I needed. Right. If we look at that is Jason, is there more research coming out? I know the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence, which for veterans is, you know, you've done the first step. Is there more? Is there going to be a deeper dive into it so that veterans have a place to go to look for information to kind of cut down the misinformation and also the challenges that Bruno went through to do all that research on his own? Absolutely. We have been uh, fortunate to be uh, funded by the federal agency in Canada, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, uh, to undertake more comprehensive guidelines and then to actually do some very dedicated knowledge uh, transfer Mm -hmm. and implementation work following that. So, um, we, we are uh, updating our guidance. We're expanding it. We expect that to be out later this calendar year. And we're then going to spend a number uh, of years working on disseminating the information, creating some of those information guidelines, pamphlets uh, for both patients and healthcare providers. So that work is coming. And there are a number of uh, trials that I know that are underway that are going to sort of add more to the knowledge that we have. The, the issue about drug substitution is a critical one. You know, this, this very important issue that, that Bruno alluded to, you know, can cannabis actually allow people to come off other medications? All medications have potential benefits, but they also have potential harms. Uh, so if we can reduce reliance on some products, that, 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 that's, that, that's desirable. And again, there's some initial evidence to suggest that that might be true. We need more information on it, but this, this is coming. Uh, and it's frustrating to those who want answers now. I understand that. But we are going to have better information later this year. And I think there's there's a real groundswell to sort of get this out there now. Because um, as you both alluded to, there's lots and lots of veterans that are using these products. And it's simply not responsible to have that happen with an absence of evidence and an absence of guidance. I mean, this research and, and that you're doing, Jason, the work you're doing, Bruno, uh, and the veterans community, I guess this is easily translated into the civilian side as well too, right? People using, I mean, they could read the research that would help them as well and your knowledge as well too, right, Bruno, that that you're doing? Yeah, because when when they made cannabis legal in Canada, you know, everybody thought that everybody would be, you know, partaking in. But I think that, uh, once again, there was a lot of information missing around the the dosage. And then you you do, they're called bud tenders when you go into a... A private store that they have in any of the provinces across Canada and they're going to tell you to the best of their knowledge you know what strain it is what it does the kind of like things you might look for but once again they're not medical professional or a scientist or a chemist or anything like that they're just the people that kind of by experience what they know and it would be good to have information for people that are struggling with mental health or chronic pain of saying okay let's start here and it's uh, with researchers like uh, Jason does and with the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence, what they do, that we'll get to those um, to those answers. And I think that uh, um, a well-informed public, a well-informed community is going to be able to help each other and to deal better with chronic pain and, and mental health, actually, and what to use. And and the clinicians as well, right? Clinicians and researchers yes. and understand point. Yeah. All practitioners, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the both of you, Jason and Bruno, for attending uh this podcast. We could talk about this for probably another hour easily. There's just so much information. And we're going to have the both of you back when we talk about psychedelics. I think that'll be the a very interesting one. As you said, Bruno, and uh, it's, you know, it's starting up and it's, people are probably interested in what's going on. So I thank you both for your time for attending the show. And uh, for our listeners, uh, if you want more information, go to the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence. And uh, the research that Jason has worked on is on the site, I believe, so people can read to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be on with you. Thank you, Tom. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.